Transform TV. We're going to be talking to these cell guys today a little bit and some of the things that are going on with fiber in our community that we want you to be informed on. Uh, we'll try to look a little bit from this position as far as to show you what uh, they're working on top of the Viking Tower uh, building here or the Verizon. Those uh, what, what a layman would probably reference as an antenna uh, a, a sending out signal, receiving signal from your cell phone, from uh, your uh, notepad, uh, that type of thing. And uh, they're in the process of putting some fiber up, uh, uh, up to the top of that. And uh, uh, we'll give you, uh, uh, let him explain to what he's doing. At the same time, we'll kind of give you a little look over here, somewhat slow. I'm back to my old tripod and said, a nice smooth one I borrowed, but. Uh, um, that just had a screw loose on a leg. I wasn't beating up my equipment or anything when I said uh, they were broke. It was just uh, my old deals because it broke. It was just cheap plastic, but uh, the other one had a leg that needed to be a, a snap over leg that needed some uh, uh, tightening. But you see those antennas over there? That's uh, uh, at the Vaultus building uh, right in the same block as U.S. Bank here in Alexandria. And you see the antennas on top of that where they added the middle one there uh, for AT&T that is their data, uh, uh, 5G uh, capabilities. And uh, uh, so you, you reference when I talk about a, a white antenna, uh, they're running three over here, Verizon's program, uh, according to uh, uh, the guy that's soon going to be talking to us is uh, they run five actually in, in uh, uh, their system up here. But just to give you a little uh, understanding what we're talking about. And yet at the same time, when we're talking technology here uh, in Alexandria this uh, July day, uh, we can also see there we focus over uh, a, a splice uh, a truck, uh, uh, a new business here in Douglas County that uh, um, Unfortunately, he didn't have time to talk to me, but I did get uh, some info out of them, and, and I could just just as well talk to the camera to see how they're doing. They're splicing right right inside uh, uh, a trailer there in an enclosed environment. Uh, uh, but uh, here's kind of, I'm going to focus the camera out here a little bit and uh, swing it around maybe to the light side. We'll let... Uh, We'll give Bremer Bank a little free commercial here in the background. And uh, uh, a couple of things we want you to understand. And I think I can uh, uh, turn my screen here so I can see it a little bit uh, as well as what I'm showing you. Um, you got to understand what we're talking about here uh, this, what day is it? Wednesday? Um, is it the 13th or something like that or 14th I'm not sure uh, whatever Wednesday is this week and uh, uh, I just want to show you this fiber this is the fiber can you see it it's different color there uh, I got the guy from ALP was kind enough to splice it a little for me you see how small uh, with the Sun on there hopefully you're seeing this that's 12 fibers 12 of them now what I understand that uh, they're just pushing into uh, the Bremer Bank here. Uh, they're putting four of these little fibers into the Bremer Bank to handle all their data capacity, all their phone capacity. They're putting four of these in, which is kind of becoming a common way to go into business. See my fingernail? I saw there's 12 of these if I can spread them good enough, but they're putting four into the Bremer Bank here and they're, uh, they're starting to do this uh, if a uh, business gets its own fiber. They're putting four of these in people, but they're only lighting one. So they'll be what the industry calls is three of them will be dark. That's the mind boggling capacity of, of our fiber world today. And I'll give you a little sneak preview on another uh, program that I'm about to, to do with you. Um, when I talk these fibers here as I split them, hopefully you can see this. Uh, each is a different uh, color. 
when the phone system was out here over the 4th of July and all the ATM machines, uh, both the data and the phones coming into Alexandria, uh, out to uh, Arrowwood and that type of thing, when they were down, that old beaver, he cut into a, 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 a 12 cable fiber. That beaver shut down the sister, uh, city of Alexandria by chewing through, here's the blue, that, uh, the blue if you can see it uh, off the side here, that represents 12 fibers. He chewed through an old cable uh, that had 12 fibers in it. And uh, uh, because of that, that cable had uh, uh, four active, just like we just talked, that's going to go into the Bremer Bank. But the difference is that was handling all the call and data capabilities uh, that CenturyLink had in this area. In fact, that same group uh, affected the city of Granite Falls and Grove City. So to, to show you the mind-boggling power of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, two of those, and that uh, uh, can handle. Remember we also had when we were in the basement of the Vaultus building that guy said uh, one pair, or in other words one going in and one coming out uh, can handle 33 million calls at once and uh, uh, so we just want to give you some understanding of the mind-boggling capabilities. The other thing we're going to we'll touch on when we do that program, we'll give you a little heads up when we're doing technology today, is the fact that they did have a backup system. Those of you that were lucky enough to uh, uh, watch uh, when we had those splicers in there, they said they always have a backup system. Here's the interesting thing. When that fiber broke, uh, going uh, uh, along uh, uh, County Road 78 right south of the freeway. What happened there? The old beaver, he cut through this little blue cable, one like this. He probably chewed through some black stuff like this first, but he chewed through an equivalent of what you're seeing here is blue, I hope you can see. He chewed through that. And uh, unfortunately for the, all the customers at ATM machines, uh, uh, CenturyLink, uh, uh, phone customers, and uh, that type of thing, their backup system people was in the same 12 pair cable. Even though they, had, they, they were only using two, two of these little tiny uh, uh, fibers coming into uh, Alexandria to do all the phone and data transmission, ATMs, that kind of thing. That's the mind-boggling power of this stuff, people. And uh, uh, he chewed off the two active ones, but he also chewed off the two reserve. So rather than having a backup system with the triggers uh, in the vault this building to go to a different uh, fiber cable, uh, CenturyLink still had everything in the one uh, cable. So uh, um, we're going to do a little more in depth on that, but I'll give you a little heads up on some of the things Inform TV does and how sad it is that the city council uh, doesn't step forward and say, hey, we want this guy on charter too, so you can start making some money, and I'll really show you some things that are going on. Sorry for this odd position, but I think it's more important for you to understand uh, what happened over the 4th of July. A little cable with 12 of these and, and uh, um, that had uh, capabilities when you say 33 million calls per uh, pair that means one of these 12 carrier you take 33 million times uh, a, a six 200 million people if the switching systems was set up Jeff Wild out there at uh, Arrowwood, and we see him tell him he should do a little advertising with us. Uh, could ha he could have had two million, uh, 200 million guests out there over the 4th of July weekend, all talking at the phone system at the same point in time. And uh, that this, this little blue wire I'm showing here with uh, 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 these 12 wires in it, or these 12 glass uh, tubes in it, could handle the conversations of 200 million people all talking each other at once.
Just think of that. Alan Repke reporting here in downtown Alexandria. Yes, I meant to say County Road 79, south of 94. You're watching Inform TV, Alexandria, Minnesota. Hi, my name is Lane Kalina, General Manager of Farmers Union Oil Company in Alexandria. Um, we have a location also in Garfield, convenience store. Um, we deal in uh, bulk fuels, propane. Uh, we have two convenience stores, a full service shop, tire department. And whenever you're coming by our location on Broadway or Garfield, we invite you to stop in and check out all the things we have to offer. Uh, we are a cooperative and we do pay dividends to our customers. And it is a uh, true locally owned co-op where we are self-sufficient, we're owned by our members and all dividends, anything that's made here is paid back to our customers. So stop in and check us out and buy a tank of gas. Inform TV here, we're by the Vikings Tower building, a uh, 13 story high rise right across from the Bremer Bank. Uh, we got the uh, gentleman here, they're working on uh, uh, getting some fiber and, uh, up to uh, the new data stream up there for uh, fiber, for Verizon, excuse me. Sir, introduce yourself and tell us what you've been doing here the last couple days and a couple days left, I hear. Yep, we got a couple days left. I'm um, Andy Winters, I'm with Mill City Tech. Um, working for Verizon currently. And what we're doing right now is uh, we already pulled our main hybrid, it's our power and fiber together. It's about an uh, inch and a quarter size. Goes all the way up and then all the way across the rooftop to each sector. There's three sectors per site. You have an X, a Y, and a Z. Also, we also got the roofers with us. So that kind of makes things a little bit more hairy, a little bit more interesting because everything up there right now is on skids. So we have to pull the skids back while they re-roof our area and we got to push everything back. So we have to disconnect everything and then reconnect it back up. But so th they're putting rubber roof up there or tire roof? It's all rubber. Okay. We're all doing all the rubber up there. And, and part of the reason they're doing it is because you're running lines around and, and yep. uh, they don't have the roof the leak. Yep, that too. And they're not liable for, they don't want to be liable, obviously, for any, if there were any damages, so that's another reason why we're out here. Okay, and uh, I gave you a piece of fiber. Uh, you said you're running uh, a combination of a cable a little bigger than this one that's got both power to fund, uh, to uh, uh, energize, the, I suppose, the light beams or whatever's in the fiber. Yep, it's all going up to a remote radio head unit. It's a RF module. Um, from there, it'll go from our power will hook up into it's like a what's called an OVP where all our power terminates and our fiber terminates and then from there it'll terminate to our uh, RRHs, our radio heads, and then from there it will go to the antennas. Okay. Because if you see all right now, Speak louder. If you see right now we got all the coax going up that's just either going to uh, TMA which is a tower mounted amplifier or it's going to a diplexer which will diplex different frequencies. But with all that like I said, as you can see, it's pretty much one big continuous run. Well, there's the power and fiber. You know, you can separate a little bit more. And you can go, you can branch out to different sectors just off of one run. So that's another advantage. Plus, it's fiber optics. It's going to be a lot quicker. And, and so from a standpoint, you were telling me, uh, I, I've got that little piece of fiber there. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you're running uh, 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 24 lines up. and. 24 down or 12 up and 12 down? It'd be a total of 12 up, 12 down. Okay. So we have an A and a B, so we got a continuous loop of data going. Sure. You maybe show the people a little bit there with the, the fiber yeah. right in your finger there. There's 12 in one, one that blue one there has, mm -hmm. uh, if people can see that, that has 12 fiber in it, right? Yep. And, and, and so what you guys are actually running would be uh, two of those small wires, but they're in a bigger cable is Correct. what you're telling us. Plus you guys have... Uh, uh, power going up and you I think before when I talked to a crew here or somebody they they had uh, a, a combination of uh, uh, the power is 48 volt is that what it is yep correct 40, 48 uh, DC and explain a little more though those lines in the background that you're in the process of covering again we got uh, uh, 
uh, uh, linemen working up there uh, as well. Uh, those cables looks like what do you got? At least a dozen of those. What what really is their function? Will that still be functioning, or will this fiber take care of uh, replace them? Uh, a lot of the carriers, you know, they're moving to more powered fiber. But as of right now, Verizon. Speak louder so I can hear you. <laughs> Verizon is one of the main carriers. I mean, every carrier uses coax still. Okay. But a lot of them are starting to transition just because it's faster and they can run more off of that. But a lot of your general frequencies, like for example, each one of these sectors has four hard lines. So those big lines going yep. up, there's four of them. You have uh, CDMA, <coughs> which is like your call, whatever, messaging. You have your PCS, but that's Diplex. And then you also have uh, LTE, which everyone knows about LTE. And then we're doing our AWS upgrade, and that's what we're doing. Currently. And and so from a standpoint, will those lines then be functional yet, or basically could those be phased out? What you're doing? Nope, they can. They're not be phased out. And and explain up there. I don't know if I can see it from this vantage, but obviously people have seen it before. You've got. Uh, 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 and on the three corners, you have those uh, 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 three white uh, antenna type things. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the new one you're putting up, that's a little bigger one or a little longer? It's actually going to be about the same size as the other. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I, I can see a little bit of it up here. But, <clears throat> but yeah, so our Verizon has five antennas. Okay. Well, there'll four. be five up here now? There's going to be five. Okay. But we also had to add a 14 foot chunk of uh, angled steel. Angled steel for the skid to okay. add for the correct spacing of our antennas for the radiation so that they're not too close to yeah, and they're not shadowing each other and then you know we're, not, we're getting a good solid signal and so when they they drive by and look on uh, the roof of uh, the building here uh, after I air this they'll see you said you'll see five of these white uh, uh, antennas yep. and and the middle one is that the new one the middle one is LTE That's and explain big, what LTE big is square one LTE is basically, well, it's running off our lowest frequency. Okay. So it's running off a 700 frequency. And that frequency will penetrate mostly anything, which is good because everybody wants fastest. And that will go out further than the old ones? Correct. Yep, it will. It's going to be still going the same, but... It has a better penetration correct. with these new type radios uh, that you reference. Yep. And, and from a standpoint of uh, uh, that will be more more data friendly and handling more in the way of data is what you're saying? Yep, correct, exactly. You'll be able to transmit and receive more data. When you say data, what are you talking about? You, you're talking about if they want to watch television or download a movie or or uh, what's your definition of data for the general public? I would say data would be anything from surfing the web, downloading music, streaming music, downloading movies, basically references all your data. Okay. And sending, sending and receiving pictures too. And and w could those things be also functional for phone as well? But uh, are in this case, they're not being used for phone at all. The other the, the other four are used for the phone, man. Yeah, because we'll have our LTE and our AWS are our main data. Okay. And then so your PCS and your CDMA, those are mostly just for your straight calls. Okay. Calls and text messages. And 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 from a standpoint, then uh, all that. Uh, uh, items that you just mentioned from those five uh, antennas up there, those kind of white tall things people need to understand. Uh, th 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 everything from them will be coming in the fiber now or will some of that still be coming down the, the old uh, heavy lines it's there? It's still going to be routed with the coax. The only thing that we are adding power and fiber to is the AWS. So well, that's running at a higher frequency. And that's the one you said for, 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 the, for the data end? Mm -hmm. Yep, LTE okay. and uh, AWS. And maybe can you explain to us a little what uh, uh, you mean from uh, uh, why that needs to uh, uh, have the fiber where something else doesn't? Well, basically, <coughs> like it, I said, why the coax can't handle that? Uh, the coax could. Um, and see, but the thing is, instead of adding an RF module or more RF modules, just through the coax, we're running it through the power and fiber. So we're having two remote radio heads. For one remote re remote radio head per sector, but let's say so Verizon wants to shut down, you know whatever they can do it straight from their office and shut down that radio, shut down you know one port or two ports on the antenna. 
Does Verizon also have other towers in town, or is this their main tower now? Um, I'm sure they have other ones. They're all over. You know, they have some of the fastest technology ever. And from a there. standpoint of, of the fiber we're talking here, uh, it, is uh, that going into the ALP uh, uh, guys? I, I see, uh, or is that going into Gardenville? I see the. Uh, uh, there's a splicer down the uh, end down here. Are you working with that uh, vehicle on the end down there? You see what I'm talking about? Uh, he's um, a fiber splicer. No, I'm not. You're not? You're, no. you're just going in. Did you guys yourself, uh, uh, the, the new wire coming down the side of the building, mm -hmm. did you hook that fiber up yourself? You got yep. your own crews to do that? Yes, we do. Okay, okay, that, that's interesting. And from a standpoint of, uh, so for the crane, uh, uh, everything you guys did, you pull it up, uh, uh, hook and uh, uh, tackle, so to speak, like you had uh, one of your partners there hanging uh, mm -hmm. uh, by a rope, plus he's got, a, I see a safety cord to a, the second rope. Is that, yep. am I reading that right? Correct, yep. We are always tied off 100%, even on top of that rooftop, we are always tied off. And, and so when you took the antenna and the radio and up, you just put it up with a hook and, what do you call it, a hook and tackle or whatever you pulled up? Or did you have the Most crane lift some of your stuff up being there here? Uh, we might have the crane lift one of our skids to move it, and that would be the one facing this side of town. Um, but a lot of times it's all rope and pulleys, you know, and hoists. And, and from a standpoint, you guys are out of the Twin Cities, is that where you based? Yeah, we are located out of Fridley. Okay, and you work just for Verizon or you work for any or all of them? We work for all the carriers. And you got uh, a number of crews or you tend to be the outstate crew or how do you figure it that way? Um, I would say that there's, I think there's nine uh, cell crews, cell okay. tower crews right now. Okay. Um, and we travel constantly. Okay. We're all over the place. I've been all the way out to Pennsylvania, Missouri, you know, and all in between. Okay, well that, that sounds interesting. So uh, from a standpoint of uh, uh, this uh, uh, 5G then, or the center t uh, uh, antennae, that's going to shoot out at least 15 miles, are you kind of thinking, or what about oh, that? Yeah, 15, I would probably say 30. It, it'll shoot out 30 where if somebody's Roughly. sitting on the boat over here on Lake Osakis uh, uh, they could be bringing down data uh, is, is television going to become a big thing when you when you talk about the data is will that be the source for people wanting to look at television or iPad and that kind of thing or uh, what, well, what's your thought that way well you have to figure too a lot of your tablets and all that is run through whatever care you get it through, through yep. Verizon, through whoever. And that's another reason why they want to add this extra data. Because a lot of times with all the data and all these new technologies with, you know, your nugs and everything coming out, sometimes you get so much traffic on these cell sites that it's almost overloading. Then it'll have to take some people and jump them to a different tower. So, so what, what what you're actually doing here then is 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 you're adding a terrific amount of bandwidth. That is that correct. the right layman's term? Basically, we're just adding, we're just getting more bang for your buck. And from a standpoint of bandwidth, then by putting that uh, new radio up there, antenna in the middle, uh, how much bandwidth improvement will you be doing for Verizon? Will it double, triple? I, there? I would say it is. It should double. Double double their capacity of what they already had up there. Correct by just putting the, this new style yep. what we call radio and and yep, uh, remote radio head okay that, that'll push out a lot further the other four that are up there what what kind of range do they tend to have they have about the same the only difference is uh, with the different frequencies is the penetrating capability okay because even like your am towers you know they're running on a shorter it's a smaller frequency to penetrate more okay so that's another reason because with the AWS, a lot of times in these, some of these cities, it'll like to bounce off, you know, other stuff. <coughs> bounce off the objects, trees, what have you. Yep. Um, but LT just likes to penetrate everything just because it's a lower frequency. Okay. But with the AWS, it'll pick up anything else that the LT is missing. And, and you've got uh, switching equipment that, from a consumer standpoint, some, it's going to uh, jump around to whatever it takes to uh, uh, keep a, a connection is what you're saying. Correct. 
Okay. Uh, anything else you want to uh, tell uh, the, the people that are using cell phones and uh, uh, notepads and all those kind of things that, that they need to be aware of that you're going to be bringing out next? Or should this take care of them for a couple years? Uh, well, there's plenty of work to do. Uh, cell phones aren't going anywhere. Um, another thing, you know, if you ever get a chance, take a look at us. Take a look at cell towers. You don't think, you don't really notice, you know, that there's that many out there, but there's a lot of them out there. And are are, are all those cell towers connected to fiber today, or are they connected to old coax? A lot of them, yeah. There's still a lot of them that are coax, um, but a lot of them, majority of them now have power and fiber on them. And and that's just not just for Verizon, that's for everybody. For everybody, area. great. Yeah. That's what they call open architecture, the fiber, everybody yeah. can can use it, that type of thing. And uh, uh, so from your standpoint, you, you know 10 times more, 1,000 times more than I or than my audience will ever know about this stuff. Are, are you seeing, are you guys already carrying what they call a 5G phone? Are you still carrying 4G? What Can you give us a little thought process on that? Uh, this is this would still be their 4G LTE. Okay. But it's like I don't know the exact name of what Verizon's calling it. It's a 4G LTE Extreme or whatever. Uh, 4G LTE X, I think it was. Maybe. And 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 so do you see the next version of phones? Everybody's going to be buying a 5G, uh, or is it going to go higher than that? Will it continue to go up? What's your thought process that way? You know, I mean, you can only with fiber optics. You know, it's already running at speed of light. Yep. So you can only improve on that so much, uh, but you can improve the way that it's functioning. And explain what would be the difference between 3G and 4G or 4G and 5G? Uh, 3G would be basically like, well, number one, it cannot carry as much data with it. Okay. So your download times are going to be slower, you know, all, <clears throat> that's going to be slower. Your 4G, everything is quicker, 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 quicker. You know, it's basically moving at the speed of light. Is, is so from from when we go if this new antenna's got 5g capabilities uh, is that kind of uh, going to be uh, the maximum as far as what people need once you go to the speed of light whether it's 4g or 5g is is that kind of your thought or what about that I mean like I said you can improve on the system it's hard to improve on the technology yeah um, so you know, granted, they can change a few things that can make it that much quicker. You know, um, every carry goes through there. We got to work out our kinks. You know, so. But from the most part, what you're saying, but what you're doing right now is probably wanting to watch television on that iPad you have, or or download a movie to it, or any other data transmission. Uh, it it probably uh, is at the point where. Uh, the customer is going to be happy. Oh yeah, extremely happy. Okay. I have Verizon myself. Love them. Our company uses Verizon too for our work phones. They're amazing. And, and are you at presently at four or a guy like yourself? Are they letting you test a 5G phone or don't, doesn't anybody have them out I yet? I know nothing of a 5G. Okay. Like I said, um, Everything's 4G still, to my knowledge. Okay, so uh, uh, from this standpoint, even though we may be calling a, a 5G antenna up there, it's it's going to be kind of folded into whatever's out there. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a 4G plus kind of thing, you know. Okay. Any other thoughts you want to give us? Uh, no, just uh, don't take cell towers for granted. It's a dangerous job, and what was that? As, as you were talking, I have your buddy over your shoulder all the time. I'm sure people are, are, are looking at him the whole time. So thanks for talking to Inform TV. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Great for having me. Thanks. Here we got uh, Jerry bringing in dignitaries to the construction site today. And uh, Jerry, any good words from Roadrunner Taxi this morning? Just beep, beep. Get her done. They'll get her done. It's kind of an impressive project, right? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll catch you later. Bye. Roadrunner Taxi. You're watching Inform TV, Alexandria, Minnesota. Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. My guest this week is Paul Bailey. Paul is a fishery supervisor for the South Central District 
Uh, Paul, you're currently involved in a very comprehensive tagging study on walleye. Let's talk about the study first off and uh, just what it is and how long you've been doing it. Sure, this is the, the first, like you said, real comprehensive tagging study that we've ever conducted between Garrison Dam and Oahe Dams on, on the walleye population that, that exists between those two dams. Uh, in the past, North Dakota has kind of done their own thing with tagging studies. South Dakota has done their own thing, but this is the first time we really come together to do, a, like you said, a more comprehensive tagging study uh, using, I guess, help from both agencies, tagging fish in both North Dakota and South Dakota. And then uh, some folks at South Dakota State University are also involved in the project. Uh, uh, Eli Feltz is using this uh, in pursuit of his PhD at South Dakota State University. So it's uh, three agencies are really uh, involved uh, in this project. And we talked about comprehensive, and by that we mean very large numbers of fish that you're tagging. Right. Our, our goal has been to tag uh, uh, 10,000 fish uh, throughout each year of this study, and uh, there will be four years of tagging. Uh, 23, yeah, 2013 was our first year. Uh, what we tagged this spring was the second year of the study, and then 2015 and 16 will also be tagging fish. Uh, so we've tagged nearly 10,000 fish, nearly reached our goals. Uh, South Dakota fell a little bit short. They uh, had some trouble finding fish in the, the southern reaches of, of Lake Oahe to get their the, to meet their tagging goals. But what are you hoping to gather? What kind of information from uh, this study? First and foremost, uh, I guess the, the most crucial pieces of information we're getting is information on walleye mortality. So how many fish are surviving from year to year, and then uh, what proportion of those fish are also being harvested by anglers. And that information will allow us to do some population modeling uh, that will basically tell us, do we have the most appropriate regulations in place uh, for the long-term good of this fishery? What kind of results are you getting back, if, if you have results back yet? Yeah, we're, we're, the first results are trickling in. Uh, we're always a little hesitant to hang too much on just one year of a study. That's why we're doing four years. You know, one year might be you know, a little misleading uh, sure. just by itself. But last year, it looked like we had a, a harvest rate of about 25%, which is definitely on the high end of uh, what we typically see for walleye populations in, in this part of the world. Uh, so that was a pretty high ex rate of exploitation, but we had a you know, fair number of walleye in the system, and with the forage issues that we had, uh, those fish were definitely hungry and cooperating with anglers. And then at the same time, South Dakota had much more liberal limits in place uh, during the 2013 fishing season. They're, they had their typical uh, four fish limit and then what they called their, their four fish kind of bonus fish where English could harvest an additional four fish under 15 inches. Sure. So uh, that did I think contribute to the, the elevated rate to harvest that we saw in 2013. What we're seeing so thus far in 2014 is a much lower rate of harvest. It doesn't look like we're going to even hit 15 percent harvest rate this year. Uh, you mentioned you have a couple of more years yet that you're going to be tagging walleyes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people won't be able to find these tagged fish. They're going to be around for a long time, hopefully. Yeah, we do occasionally see uh, walleye in the Missouri River system living up into their late teens. So uh, anglers are, I guess, encouraged to keep their eyes open for these fish for, for years to come. If you mm -hmm. get a lot of uh, information off of these tags, uh, if you do catch a fish with a tag, of course, the information is on there. But if you look closely, some of these tags are worth money. Right, uh, a small portion of these ta of, of the fish that we tagged are tagged with reward tags. Those fish are worth uh, $100 if anglers report them. Um, the reason behind that is it allows us to estimate uh, non-reporting rate. So basically, some past research has shown that if uh, a, a tagged fish is worth $100, basically we can assume a 100% reporting rate. It's basically to any angler is willing to go through the motions to report a tag if it's worth $100. So that will allow us to calibrate you know, uh, the non-reporting rate for non-reward tags, which is really a crucial component to the study. Um, it seems like fishing, particularly this summer, has been good south end of Lake Oahe from state line to Langlers to cattail has been really good seeing a lot of fish in the system does that mean that things are starting to rebound a little bit from the disastrous years of the flood of 2011? Yeah well things are looking a little better in the North Dakota portion of Lake Oahe than they have in recent years and we did see some forage fish recovery down there in 2013. Basically 2011 and 2012 were two of the poorest years of forage fish production we've ever seen. Uh, 2013, we did see a bit of uh, successful reproduction by some of our warm water spawning fish, white bass and crappie in particular. So that did provide a little bit of forage boost in the North Dakota portion of Lake Hawaii. We're still far from recovered, but at least we saw a bit of improvement last year. Uh, the Missouri River uh, between Lake Oahe and Garrison Dam is still really struggling though. Uh, and that's 
largely attributable, I think, to some of the habitat changes that we've seen in the in the Missouri River. Sure. Basically, as a result of the flood, the Missouri River uh, is much more ditch-like uh, than it was in the past. Uh, the the downcutting that occurred during the flood uh, really eliminated a lot of the really productive side channel backwater areas that are key to uh, forage fish production in the garrison reach of the Missouri River. So we're hoping long term we'll start seeing some recovery there, but uh, we didn't see much uh, for recovery in the in the Missouri River in 2013. But Lake Oahe, some improvement. You mentioned forage populations are up a little bit. How about fish populations themselves? Uh, the the last really strong year class or good year of walleye reproduction we've seen was in 2009. Uh, in the fish that we aged last year, actually about 70 percent of the walleye. Uh, in between the North Dakota South Dakota border and Garrison Dam about 70 percent of those fish are fish that were hatched in 2009 so that's a really strong dominant year class and like I said we haven't seen uh, a whole lot of reproduction since but that's largely due to the the forage issues that are out there so uh, walleye numbers you know are, are going to continue to decline hopefully trying to bring predator and prey back into balance uh, so then if that happens uh, we might see walleye numbers start to rebound a little bit too how about now everybody talks about the, the spring and fall migrations of walleyes from South Dakota up to North Dakota or vice versa. Is that happening? Is that a myth? Is that... Yeah, well, our, the past tagging studies we've done really indicated that's not occurring. There's not any sort of mass walleye migration. And the, the walleye that we tagged in 2013 really kind of confirmed that. Uh, basically, about 55% of the walleye that were tagged between Garrison Dam and uh, Oahe dams moved less than 10 miles uh, from the time we tagged them till anglers caught them, which doesn't indicate that these walleye are moving very much. However, as you move further upstream, those walleye did become more mobile. So basically fish that were tagged in the Missouri River above Lake Oahe tended to move greater distances than fish tagged down closer to Oahe Dam. Uh, but what we saw uh, based on last year's information was very few fish moved from the South Dakota portion of Lake Oahe into North Dakota. Basically about 1% of the fish that were tagged in South Dakota moved into North Dakota. On the flip side, about 30% of the fish that we tagged in North Dakota traveled to South Dakota where they were harvested. So based on one year's worth of data, it looked like North Dakota was a net exporter of fish. So in essence, the fish that are being caught, let's say Cattail Bay, are local fish. Yeah, uh, generally that's the case. Uh, these fish tend to move very small distances, uh, and that's just walleye's nature. They're not a highly migratory fish species. But, I mean, to every rule, there is an exception. We had one walleye that was tagged uh, in the Garrison Dam spillway channel uh, that was caught about a month later, uh, 298 miles downstream at Okobojo Point. So, individual fish do go, uh, are, uh, occasionally do travel, but generally, I think it's safe to say that these walleye are not highly migratory. Uh, I guess another example of that is that at the fish that were tagged at Beaver Bay in 2013, about 40% of those fish were caught by, uh, that anglers caught, were caught uh, in the North Dakota portion of Lake Oahe. About 30% of the fish traveled upstream into the Garrison Reach uh, above Lake Oahe, and another 30% traveled into South Dakota. So it's, it's not any sort of organized migration that these fish move from South Dakota into North Dakota upstream. It's some walleye just uh, swim uh, to different locations, uh, more so than any sort of organized migration. So you can read into these numbers what you will, but as soon as you start getting maybe more information back from this tagging study, you'll know more. Exactly. Yep. All right. Thanks, Paul. The North Dakota State Fair runs from July 18th through the 26th at the State Fairgrounds in Minot. All the exhibits that Greg talked about previously will be open from 1 to 7 p.m. daily at the Game and Fish Department's Outdoor Skills Park. The park is located on the north end of the fairgrounds right across from the All Seasons Arena. And remember, all venues, exhibits, and features at the park are free. For Paul Bailey and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week. You're watching Inform TV, Alexandria, Minnesota.